Happy Christmas, everyone. I hope you're able to enjoy some time off with family and friends over the next few days. Things are still on the quiet side here in the UK. Theatre is just about up and running as I write, and we can only hope that that opening can be maintained, although things are not looking great. We'll have to wait and see. Please do make an effort to see live theatre over the holidays, wherever you are, if you can, and feel safe to do so. Theatre really needs all the support it can get at the moment. This year, I thought we could dive away from Renaissance Theatre briefly and mark the holiday season with a story from the more recent past. The theatrical connection to this story is the author, Damon Runyon. He was born in 1880 to a newspaper family in Kansas, left school early and began newspaper work himself, becoming a sports journalist specialising in the local semi-professional baseball teams. He moved to New York in 1910 and took up the post of baseball correspondent for Hearst Corporation newspapers, a post that he held for many years, but there was more to him than just being a sports journalist. Sports journalism at the time was no easy desk job, and Runyon spent 30 years walking the streets of New York, and particularly the Broadway area, mixing with the gamblers who fed their habit on horse racing and the dice game craps, and pretty much anything else that they could make a wager on. These were the Prohibition years, when alcohol was only officially available for medical purposes, and a whole culture around illegal liquor had developed. The gamblers mixed with bootleggers and illegal drinkers, and New York gangland thrived. Within this boozy gambling circle, Runyon became friendly with some of the major figures in the New York mob, whose behaviours and style of speech became the inspiration for many short stories he wrote, set in the sleazier side of contemporary Manhattan. The characters are as colourful as their speech, which is reported by an often unspecified observer to a series of events. His characters have a complex vocabulary of slang which places them very specifically in time and place. But the most noticeable thing about Runyon's style is that characters and narrators speak almost exclusively in the present tense, even when remembering the past or speculating on the future. We often hear people speak this way, but its use in literature is almost exclusive to Runyon. It is this strong sense of location and character and time that led to the creation of the musical Guys and Dolls in 1950, four years after Runyon's death, based on two of his short stories. Although not the most politically correct musical, it is still, in my opinion, one of the all-time greats. And if you remember the characters of Nathan Detroit, Sarah Brown, Sky Masterson, Miss Adelaide and Nicely Nicely Johnson from a production or from the 1955 film, well... These are Runyon-esque characters translated with little change into musical theatre. Numbers like Sit Down, You Rock in the Boat and Luck Be a Lady are still theatrical set pieces. A local production I saw as a child is still a strong theatrical memory for me, and I enjoyed a more recent production about six years ago when Rebel Wilson gave us a somewhat updated Miss Adelaide. But for today, as it's Christmas, I have a Christmas story from Damon Runyon, for which I feel I have to issue two warnings. Firstly, there's a lot of drinking in this story, which is somewhat the narrator's excuse for his dodgy involvement with the other characters. I haven't ever tried the hot Tom and Jerry that they drink, although this is something I hope to rectify over Christmas this year. But I shall restrict myself to just one, or maybe two. Drink responsibly, folks. The other warning is that I've tried to read the story with an appropriate New York accent. I think it's landed somewhere west and quite a long way south of New York, but try as I might, I couldn't emulate the true New York, even when I thought of The Sopranos or Colombo. So apologies, particularly to any of you on the east coast of America. No offence was intended. What I did learn very quickly is that you just cannot read these stories in an English accent. That just doesn't work. So with my thanks for another year of listening and best wishes for the holiday, here is... Dancing Dan's Christmas by Damon Runyon. Now one time it comes on Christmas, and in fact it's the evening before Christmas, and I am in good time Charlie Bernstein's little speakeasy on West 47th Street, wishing Charlie a Merry Christmas and having a few hot Tom and Jerry's with him. This hot Tom and Jerry is an old-time drink that is once used by one and all in this country to celebrate Christmas with. And in fact, it is once so popular that many people think Christmas is invented only to furnish an excuse for hot Tom and Jerry's. Although, of course, this is by no means true. But anyway, 
I tell you that there is nothing that brings out the true holiday spirit like Hot Tom and Jerry's. And I hear that since Hot Tom and Jerry go out of style in the United States, the holiday spirit is never quite the same. The reason Hot Tom and Jerry goes out of style is because it is necessary to use rum, and one thing and another in making Tom and Jerry. And naturally, when rum becomes illegal in this country, Tom and Jerry will also be against the law, because rum is something that is very hard to get around town these days. For a while, some people try making hot Tom and Jerry without putting rum in it, but somehow it never has the same old holiday spirit, so nearly everybody finally gives up in disgust, and that is not surprising, as making Tom and Jerry is by no means child's play. In fact, it takes quite an expert to make a good Tom and Jerry. And in the days when it's not illegal to make good hot Tom and Jerry, a maker commands good wages and many, many friends. Now, of course, Good Time Charlie and I are not using rum in the Tom and Jerry we are making, as we do not wish to do anything illegal. What we are using is rye whiskey that Good Time Charlie gets on a doctor's prescription from the drugstore. As we are personally drinking this hot Tom and Jerry, and naturally, we are not foolish enough to use any of Good Time Charlie's own rye in it. The prescription for the rye whiskey comes from old Doc Moggs, who prescribed it for Good Time Charlie's rheumatism in case Charlie happened to get any rheumatism. As Doc Moggs says, there is nothing better for rheumatism than rye whiskey, especially if it is made up in a hot Tom and Jerry. In fact, old Doc Moggs comes around and has a few sidles of hot Tom and Jerry himself with us for his own rheumatism. He comes around during the afternoon for a good time Charlie and I start making this Tom and Jerry early in the day, so as to be sure to have enough to last us over Christmas, and it is now along towards six o'clock, so our holiday spirit is practically 100%. Well, as Good Time Charlie and I are expressing our holiday sentiments to each other over our hot Tom and Jerry, and I am trying to think up that poem about the night before Christmas and all through the house, which I know will interest Charlie no little, all of a sudden there's a big knock at the front door, and when Charlie opens the door, who comes in carrying a large packet under his arm but a guy by the name of Dancing Dan? This Dancing Dan is a good-looking young guy who always seems well-dressed and he is called by the name of Dancing Dan because he has a great hand for dancing around and about with dolls in nightclubs and in other spots where there is any dancing. In fact, Dan never seems to be doing anything else, although I hear rumours that when he is not dancing, he is carrying up the most illegal manner in any one thing or another. But of course, you can always hear rumours in this town about anybody, and personally, I am rather fond of Dancing Dan, as he always seems to be getting a great belt out of life. Anybody in town will tell you that Dancing Dan is a guy with no Barnaby whatsoever in him, and in fact, he has about as much gizzard as anyone around, although I wish to say I always question his judgement in dancing so much with Miss Muriel O'Neill, who works at the Half Moon nightclub. And the reason I question his judgement in this respect is because everybody knows that Miss Muriel O'Neill is a doll who is very well thought of by Heine Schmitz. And Heine Schmitz is not a guy who will take kindly to anybody dancing more than one and a half with a doll that he thinks well of. This Heine Schmitz is a very influential citizen in Harlem, where he has large interests in beer and other business enterprises, and it is by no means violating any confidence to tell you that Heine Schmitz will just as soon blow your brains out as look at you. In fact, I hear sooner. Anyway, he's not a guy to monkey with, and many citizens take the trouble to advise Dancing Dan that he is not only a way out of line in dancing with Miss Muriel O'Neill, but that he is knocking his own price down to where he is no price at all. But Dancing Dan only laughs, ha ha ha, and goes on dancing with Miss Muriel O'Neill any time he gets a chance. And Good Time Charlie says he does not blame him for that, as Miss Muriel O'Neill is so beautiful that he would be dancing with her himself no matter what if he was just five years younger, and can get a Roscoe out as fast as the days when he runs with Paddy the Link and the other fast guys. Well, anyway... As Dancing Dan comes in, he weighs up the joint with a quick peek, and then he tosses the package he's carrying into the corner, where it goes plunk, as if there's something very heavy in it. And then he steps up to the bar alongside Charlie and me, and wishes to know what we are drinking. Well, naturally, we start boasting about Hot Tom and Jerry to Dancing Dan, and he says he will take a crack at it with us. And after one crack, Dancing Dan says that he will have another crack, 
and Merry Christmas to us with it. And the first thing anybody knows is that a couple of hours later, and we are still having cracks at the Hot Tom and Jerry with Dancing Dan, and Dan says he never drinks anything so soothing in his life. In fact, Dancing Dan says that he will recommend Tom and Jerry to everybody he knows, only he does not know anyone good enough for Tom and Jerry, except maybe Miss Muriel O'Neill, and she does not drink anything with drugstore rye in it. Well, several times while we are drinking this Tom and Jerry, customers come to the door of Good Time Charlie's little speakeasy and knock, but by now Charlie is commencing to be afraid that they will wish Tom and Jerry too, and he does not feel that we have enough for ourselves, so he hangs out a sign which says closed on account of Christmas. And the only one he will let in is a guy by the name of Uki, who is nothing but an old rum-dum, and who is going around all week dressed as Santa Claus and carrying a sign advertising Mo Lewinsky's clothing joint around 6th Avenue. This Uki is still wearing his Santa Claus outfit when Charlie lets him in, and the reason Charlie permits such a character as Uki into his joint is because Uki does the porter work for Charlie when he's not Santa Claus for Mo Lewinsky, such as sweeping out and washing the glasses and one thing and another. Well, it's about 9.30 when Uki comes in, and his puppies are aching, and he is all petered out generally from walking up and down and here and there with his sign, for any time a guy is Santa Claus for Mo Lewinsky, he must earn his dough. In fact, Uki is so fatigued and his puppies hurt him so much that Dancing Dan and Good Time Charlie and I feel very sorry for him and invite him to have a few mugs of Hot Tom and Jerry with us and wish him a plenty of Merry Christmas. But old Oki is not accustomed to Tom and Jerry, and after about a fifth mug, he folds up in a chair and goes right to sleep on us. He is wearing a pretty good Santa Claus makeup, what with a nice red suit trimmed with white cotton, and a wig and a false nose, and a long white whiskers, and a big sack stuffed with excelsior on his back. And if I do not know Santa Claus were not apt to be such a guy as will snore loud enough to rattle the windows, I would think Oki is Santa Claus, sure enough. Well, we forget Uki and let him sleep, and go on with our hot Tom and Jerry's, and, in the meantime, we try to think up a few songs appropriate to Christmas. And Dancing Dan finally renders My Dad's Dinner Pail in a nice baritone of loud voice, while I do first rate with Will You Still Love Me in December as you do in May. But personally, I always think good time Charlie Bernstein a little out of line trying to sing a hymn in Jewish on such an occasion, and it causes words between us. While we are singing, many customers come to the door and knock, and then they read Charlie's sign, and this seems to cause some unrest among them, and some of them stand outside saying, it's a great outrage, until Charlie sticks his noggin out the door and threatens to bust someone's beezer if they don't get about their business and stop disturbing peaceful citizens. Naturally, the customers go away, as they do not wish their beezers busted, and Dancing Dan and Charlie and I continue drinking our hot Tom and Jerry, and with each Tom and Jerry, we are wishing one another a very Merry Christmas and sometimes a very Happy New Year too. Although, of course, this does not go for Good Time Charlie as yet because Charlie has his New Year separate from Dancing Dan and me. By and by, we take to waking Oki up in his Santa Claus outfit and offering him more hot Tom and Jerry and wishing him Merry Christmas. But Oki only gets sore and calls us names, so we can see he does not have the right holiday spirit in him and let him alone until just about midnight when Dancing Dan wishes to see how he looks as Santa Claus. So good time Charlie and I help Dancing Dan pull off Oki's outfit and put it on Dan, and this is easy, as Oki has had the Santa Claus outfit on over his ordinary clothes, and he does not even wake up when we are undressing him out of his Santa Claus uniform. Well, I wish to say I see many Santa Claus in my time, but I never see a better looking Santa Claus than Dancing Dan, especially after he gets the wig and the white whiskers fixed just right, and we put a sofa pillow that the good time Charlie just happens to have around the joint for his cat to sleep on down his pants to give Dancing Dan a nice fat stomach, such as Santa Claus was bound to have. In fact, after Dancing Dan looks at himself in the mirror a while, he is greatly pleased with his appearance while Good Time Charlie is practically hysterical, although personally I am commencing to resent Charlie's interest in Santa Claus and Christmas generally, as he by no means has any claim to these matters. But then I remember, Charlie furnishes the hot Tom and Jerry, so I am more tolerant of his views. Well, Charlie finally says, 
It's a great pity not to know where there are some stockings hung up somewhere, because then, he says, you can go and stuff things in these stockings, as I always hear this is the main idea of Santa Claus. But, Charlie says, I do not suppose anybody in this section has any stockings hung up, or if they have, he says, the chances are that they are so full of holes they will not hold anything. Anyway, Charlie says, even if there are stockings hung up, we do not have anything to stuff into them, although personally, he says, I will gladly donate a few pints of scotch. Well, I am pointing out that they have no reindeer and that a Santa Claus is bound to look at a terrible sap if he goes around without any reindeer, but Charlie remarks seem to give Dancing Dan an idea, for all of a sudden he speaks as follows. Why, Dancing Dan says, I know where a stocking is hung up. It is hung up at Miss Muriel O'Neill's flat over here on West 49th Street. This stocking is hung up by nobody but a party by the name of Grandma O'Neill, who is Miss Muriel O'Neill's grandmama. Dancing Dan says, Grandma O'Neill is going on 90-odd, he says, and Miss Muriel O'Neill tells me she cannot hold out much longer, what with one thing and another, including being a little childish in spots. Now, Dancing Dan says, I remember Miss Muriel O'Neill telling me that just the other night how Grandma O'Neill hangs up her stockings on Christmas Eve all her life. And, he says, I judge from what Miss Muriel O'Neill says that the old doll always believes Santa Claus will come along some Christmas and fill her stockings full of beautiful gifts. But, Dancing Dan says, Miss Muriel O'Neill tells me Santa Claus never does this, although Miss Muriel O'Neill personally always takes a few gifts home and pops them into the stockings to make Grandma O'Neill feel better. But of course, Dancing Dan says, these gifts are nothing much because Miss Muriel O'Neill is very poor and proud and also good and will not take a dime off anybody. And I can lick the guy who says that she will, although, Dancing Dan says, between me and Heine Schmitz and a raft of other guys I can mention, Miss Muriel O'Neill can take plenty. Well, I know that what Dancing Dan states about Miss Muriel O'Neill is quite true, and in fact it is a matter that is often discussed on Broadway, because Miss Muriel O'Neill cannot get more than 20 bobs per week working at the Half Moon, and it's well known to one and all that this is no kind of dough for a doll as beautiful as Miss Muriel O'Neill. Now, Dancing Dan goes on, it seems that while Grandma O'Neill is very happy to get whatever she finds in her stockings over the Christmas morning, she does not understand why Santa Claus is not more liberal. And he says, Miss Muriel O'Neill is saying to me that she only wishes she could give Grandma O'Neill one real big Christmas before the old doll puts her cheeks back on the rack. So, Dancing Dan states, here is a job for us. Miss Muriel O'Neill and her grandmama live all alone in a flat over on West 49th Street. And, he says, at such an hour as this, Miss Muriel O'Neill is bound to be working. And the chances are Grandma O'Neill is sound asleep. And we will just hop over there and Santa Claus will fill her stockings with beautiful gifts. Well, I say, I do not see where we are going to get any beautiful gifts this time of night, what with all the stores being closed unless we dash into an all-night drugstore and buy a few bottles of perfume and a bum toilet set, as guys always do when they forget their ever-loving wives until after store hours on Christmas Eve. But Dancing Dan says never mind about that, but let us have a few more hot Tom and Jerry's first. So we have a few more hot Tom and Jerry's. And then Dancing Dan picks up the package he heaves into the corner and dumps most of the Excelsior out of Uki's Santa Claus sack and puts the bundle in. And good time Charlie turns all the lights out but one and leaves a bottle of scotch on the table in front of Uki for a Christmas gift. And away we go. Now personally, I regret very much leaving the hot Tom and Jerry's. But then I'm very enthusiastic about going along and helping Dancing Dan play Santa Claus while Good Time Charlie is practically overjoyed, as it will be the first time in his life that Charlie has ever mixed up in so much holiday spirit. In fact, nothing will do Charlie but that we stop on a couple of spots and have a few drinks to Santa Claus's health, and these visits are a big success, although everybody is much surprised to see Charlie and me with Santa Claus, especially Charlie, although nobody recognises Dancing Dan. But of course, 
There are not hot Tom and Jerry's on these spots we visit, and we have to drink whatever is on hand, and personally, I will always believe that the noggin I have on me afterwards comes from mixing my drinks when we get to these spots with my Tom and Jerry. As we go up Broadway, headed for 49th Street, Charlie and I see many citizens we know, and give them a large hello, and I wish them a Merry Christmas. And some of these citizens shake hands with Santa Claus, not knowing he is nobody but Dancing Dan. Although later I understand that there is some gossip among the citizens, because they claim a Santa Claus with such a breath on him as our Santa Claus is a little bit out of line. And once we are somewhat embarrassed when a lot of little kids going home with their parents from a late Christmas party somewhere gather around Santa Claus with shouts of childish glee, and some of them wish to climb up on Santa Claus's legs. Naturally, Santa Claus gets a little peevish and calls them a few names and one of the parents comes up and wishes to know what is the idea of Santa Claus using such language and Santa Claus takes a punch at the parent, all of which is no doubt most astonishing to the little kids who have an idea of Santa Claus as a very kindly old guy. But of course, they do not know about Dancing Dan mixing the liquor we get in the spots we visit with his Tom and Jerry or they will understand even how Santa Claus can lose his temper. Well, finally we arrive in front of the place where Dancing Dan says Miss Muriel O'Neill and her grandmama live. And it's nothing but a tenement house not far back from Madison Square Garden. And furthermore, it's a walk-up. And at the time, there are no lights burning in the joint except a gas jet on the main hall. And by the light of the jet, we look at the names on the letterboxes such as you always find in the hall of these joints, and we see that Miss Muriel O'Neill and her grandmama live on the fifth floor. This is the top floor, and personally, I do not like the idea of walking up five flights of stairs, and I am willing to let Dancing Dan and Good Time Charlie go. But Dancing Dan insists that we must all go, and finally I agree because Charlie is commencing to argue that the right way for us to do this is to get on the roof and let Santa Claus come down the chimney, and is making so much noise, I'm afraid he's going to wake somebody up. So up the stairs we climb, and finally we come to the door on the top floor that has a little card in the slot that says O'Neill. So we know we're in the right destination. Dancing Dan first tries the knob and right away the door opens. And we are in a little two by three room flat and not much furniture in it. And what furniture there is, is very, very poor. One single gas jet is burning near a bed in the room, just off from the, where the door opens onto. And by the light of this, we see a very old doll sleeping in the bed. So we judge that this is nobody but Grandma O'Neill. On her face is a large smile, as if she were dreaming of something very pleasant. On a chair at the head of the bed is hung a long black stocking, and it seems to be such a stocking as is often patched and mended. So I can see what Miss Muriel O'Neill tells Dancing Dan about her grandmama hanging up her stockings is really true, although up to this time I had my doubts. Well, I am willing to pack in after one gander at the old doll, especially as Good Time Charlie is commencing to prowl around the flat to see if there's a chimney where Santa could come down, and is knocking things over, but Dancing Dan stands looking down at Grandma O'Neill for a long time. Finally, he unslings the sack on his back and takes out his package. He unties this package, and all of a sudden, out pops a raft of big diamond bracelets, and diamond rings, and diamond brooches, and diamond necklaces, and I do not know what all else in the way of diamonds, and Dancing Dan and I begin stuffing these diamonds into the stocking, and Good Time Charlie pitches in and helps us. There are enough diamonds to fill the stocking to the muzzle, and it's no small stocking at that, and I judge that Grandma O'Neill had a pretty fair set of bunting sticks when she was young. In fact, there are so many diamonds that we have enough left over to make a nice little pile on the chair after we fill the stocking plumb up, leaving a nice diamond-studded vanity case sticking out of the top, where we figure it will hit Grandma O'Neill's eye when she wakes up. And it is not until I get out in the fresh air again that all of a sudden I remember seeing large headlines in the afternoon papers about a 500G stick-up in the afternoon of one of the biggest diamond merchants in Maiden Lane, where he is sitting in his office. And I also recall once hearing rumours that Dancing Dan is one of the best lone hand get em up guys in the world. Naturally, I commence to wonder if I am in the proper company when I am with Dancing Dan, even if he is Santa Claus. So I leave him at the next corner, arguing with Good Time Charlie about whether they ought to go and find some more presents somewhere and look for other stockings to stuff. And I hasten home and I go to bed. The next day I find I have such a noggin on me I do not care to stir around and in fact I do not stir around much for a couple of weeks. 
Then one night I drop around to Good Time Charlie's little speakeasy and ask Charlie what he's doing. Well, Charlie says, many things are doing, and personally, he says, I am greatly surprised I do not see you at Grandma O'Neill's wake. You know Grandma O'Neill leaves this wicked world a couple of days after Christmas, Good Time Charlie says, and, he says, Miss Mule O'Neill states that Doc Moggs claims that it is at least a day after she was entitled to go. But she is sustained, Charlie says, by great happiness on finding her stockings filled with beautiful gifts on Christmas morning. According to Miss Mule O'Neill, Charlie says, Grandma O'Neill dies practically convinced that there is a Santa Claus, although, of course, he says, Miss Mule O'Neill does not tell her the real owner of the gifts, an all right guy by the name of Shapiro, leaves the gifts with her after Miss Mule O'Neill notifies him of finding the same. It seems, Charlie says, this Shapiro is a tender-hearted guy who is willing to help keep Grandma O'Neill with us a little longer when Doc Moggs says leaving the gifts with her will do it. So, Charlie says, everything is quite all right as the coppers cannot figure out anything except that maybe the rascal who takes the gifts from Shapiro gets conscience-stricken and leaves them in the first place he can find and Miss Muriel O'Neill receives the 10 G's reward for finding the gifts and returning them. And, Charlie says, I hear Dancing Dan is in San Francisco and is figuring on reforming and becoming a dancing teacher so we can marry Miss Muriel O'Neill, and of course, he said, we all hope and trust that she never learns of any details of Dancing Dan's career. Well, it's Christmas Eve a year later, and I run into a guy by the name of Shotgun Sam, who is mobbed up with Jaime Schultz in Harlem, and who is a very, very obnoxious character indeed. Well, 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 Shotgun says. The last time I see you is another Christmas Eve like this, and you are coming out of good time Charlie's joint, and, he says, you certainly have your pots on. Well, Shotgun, I say, I'm sorry you get the wrong impression of me, but the truth is, I say, on that occasion you speak of, I am suffering from a dizzy feeling in my head. It is all right with me, Shotgun says. I have a tip, this guy dancing Dan is in good time Charlie's that night, I see you, and Mocky Morgan and Gunner Jack and me are casing the joint because, he says, Jaime Schmitz is all sawed up at Dan over some doll, although, of course, Shotgun says, it is all right now, as Heine has another doll. Anyway, he says, we never get to see Dancing Dan. We watch the joint from 6.30 in the evening until daylight Christmas morning, and nobody goes in at night but old Uki, the Santa Claus guy, in his Santa Claus makeup. and Shotgun says, nobody comes out, except you, and Good Time Charlie, and Uki. Well, says Shotgun, it is a great break for Dancing Dan that he never goes in or comes out of Good Time Charlie's at that, because, he said, we are waiting for him on the second floor front of the building across the way, with some nice little thorn-offs, and under orders from Heine not to miss. Well, Shotgun, I say, Merry Christmas. Well, all right, Shotgun says, a Merry Christmas to you too. <laughs>